Welcome to the All Things Nintendo podcast. I'm Brian Shea from Game Informer, and this is a weekly podcast to discuss all the biggest news and games from the world of Nintendo. We are kind of in a weird space this week because we are in between embargoes of probably the biggest game of the year. We talked all about Zelda Tears of the Kingdom last week for a preview, but now we can't really say much more until next week. So we're going to fill in some space with this week's episode. But don't worry, if you are excited for Zelda, we will have you completely covered during the main segment as I have Zelda lore guy extraordinaire Kyle Hilliard joining me for this episode. Kyle, how are you doing? Good. I mean, you were just teasing me about, you know, how much information you have on the timeline so i don't i guess i can be lore guy i don't know <laughs> hey we're both going to be lore guys today because uh hey. the main segment today which is actually going to be one of the longer main segments i think in all things nintendo history we've not recorded it yet but i think it's going to go pretty long we're going to be diving into kind of trying to untangle the legend of zelda timeline which as you may know is a diverging and then reconverging timeline that nintendo has laid out here and uh, boy, there's a lot to unpack. And basically, the idea behind it is to catch everyone up on basically like the story of The Legend of Zelda to this point, because Tears of the Kingdom, uh, I mean, I don't think Nintendo has commented on this, but as a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, which is the current final game in the timeline, you would presume that Tears of the Kingdom is the new final game on the timeline to this point. So this is kind of just getting everybody up to speed on the, the series canon to this point. But first, we're going to kick things off with some news in this first segment. Kyle, we have been talking a lot about Mario movie uh, to, to the point that I'm, I'm kind of over talking about it, to be honest. I, I love that movie, <laughs> but I just, uh, you know, it just I'm kind of over we it. We get it. It's the biggest ge- movie in the world. And I'm terrified that it means Miyamoto is just going to go all Hollywood and not make video <laughs> games anymore. Well, hey, I'm happy for him if, if that executive producer credit, as you as you had mentioned before, If that ended up giving him just millions upon millions of dollars, I am so thrilled for that man because he deserves everything. He deserves that. I just just don't want him to stop making games is all I ask. (laughs) So hopefully one of the last times we're going to talk about this for a while, the movie has crossed the $1 billion mark at the box office. Apparently it's doing very well over in Japan, which it just opened last week in. And uh, this is the 10th animated movie ever to cross the 1 billion mark, which means it just passed the original Lion King's box office earnings. Wow. That's uh, I mean, I know that that was like, what, 1994 or something, but like, that's uh, that's a pretty good feather in your cap when you, you're passing one of the most beloved animated films and most like timeless animated films of all time. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I have a list pulled up. Box Office Mojo has it at number 43 of all time currently, and it's only going to go up from this point. Oh, yeah. I mean... It would be weird if it went down. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying I don't think it's I don't think it's apexing at 43. I think it's no. gonna, I think it's still got a ways to go. I mean, like I said, it just opened in Japan last week and it was breaking all kinds of records over there as well. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's just starting to pick up. It's like kind of, I would say, last little legs of steam, I would think. I don't I don't know what the situation is with it opening in China, which usually China will give a lot of these movies like a huge boost. Right. I know that's what happened with Warcraft when that movie came out. They like when it opened in China, it like quickly became like the biggest movie on the planet. But like we'll we'll have to see like how high this thing can really climb. Like, I don't think it's gonna reach like Frozen Two levels, but it did beat Frozen Two's opening weekend numbers. So who's to say? Yeah. I bet it will. I bet it I bet it'll like yeah, we'll see. You think it'll be the biggest animated movie of all time i think uh okay i don't know about that frozen 2 currently holds that record frozen that's so funny that frozen 2 is the one that holds it because it's like frozen 2 is like like uh it it had a big like boost at the beginning but it hasn't like uh stuck around you know (laughs) yeah well i mean it's like it's kind of like what we talk about with video games sometimes where it's like the the sequel to the bad game always pays for the sins of its predecessors. Like if Madden 22 was really, really bad, it doesn't matter if Madden 23 is the greatest football game ever created. It's probably going to sell poorly initially, at least, because everybody's like burned by Madden 22. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that's just the way this works. And Frozen 1 was a very, very good movie and extremely successful and had one of the most beloved themes of all time with Let It Go. So I'm assuming that that carried all the momentum into Frozen 2, even if it oh, I mean, maybe isn't yeah. as beloved as the first one. So, uh, you know, Kyle, in related news to the, the Mario movie, how are things going over on Twitter? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would also imagine that things aren't going super well uh, 
for the the staff over there if Illumination and Universal have anything to say about it. Did you see this uh, this news story come across? No, I don't know what you're getting at. I'm curious. There was an account that had 1.1 million followers that subscribed to Twitter Blue, which one of the perks of Twitter Blue is you can post high quality videos up to an hour. And they used that and just, uh, the, I believe the tweet was, F it, the entire Super Mario Brothers movie. And they posted it in two parts, the first part being one hour and the second part being about 30 minutes. And right. yeah, it was up for like, I think like seven or eight hours. And <laughs> during that time, according to the view count, more than 9 million people saw it. I, yeah, they did Avatar, The Way of Water as well. Oh uh, my God. I don't know if it was the same account, but God, that, yeah, that's uh, that's funny. <laughs> So it took a, a very long time thing. to get down, um, but Twitter did eventually catch on to what was happening and suspended the account. And I would imagine the legal team is uh, very busy right now. Yeah, that's that's funny. Uh, that's problematic. <laughs> Maybe don't lay off all of your employees. All right, it was all okay. <laughs> yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Your turn. <laughs> so uh, let's talk some other bad news for Switch people. Uh, last year, for Axis, they put out a game called Marvel's Midnight Suns. And uh, they were like, yeah, you know what? We're going to delay the Switch version, the PS4 version, and the Xbox One version. We're just going to focus purely on the PS5 and Xbox Series X versions. Came out last year. By all accounts, a very good game. I enjoyed the hours that I poured into it. Did you get to play it? Uh, only a little bit. I did not play very much. Not not a big strategy guy in general. Okay. I had a great time with it. I did not finish it because it's a very long game. Um, and I was excited to kind of have its version for the Switch just so I can have it on the go, because I think the Switch is an underrated strategy platform. Like, look at the games that are on it, like everything from XCOM 2 to the Mario plus Rabbit series. And just, I yeah, feel like Fire we're getting Emblem. a new strategy game, uh, Triangle Strategy, all these great games coming out. And it's a really great, like, I love playing XCOM 2 on a plane. Like, that's an awesome game to play, like, on the go. So I was excited for this to come over as well, because they're the developers that make XCOM. And they canceled it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it, it it caught me by surprise i mean i the game actually i know kind of was a commercial like it didn't really sell very well sadly um and i wonder if that was like they just didn't see you know the this the the money there maybe i don't know yeah i don't know um i don't know what the the reasoning behind it they did announce that the ps4 and xbox one versions which were delayed alongside the switch version are actually coming out next week may 11th but, uh, you know, I, I thought it was maybe a little ambitious to bring the game to Switch. And I don't know if that ended up playing a factor in it. If, like, they could kind of develop, like, simultaneously the PS4 and Xbox One version. Because there's not, like, very much difference between those two platforms. And maybe the Switch is just either architecturally or just from a power level perspective so much further down the line. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, it ended up being maybe too ambitious for them or maybe just not worth the resources but uh yeah, it's a bummer yeah I, I was again i was excited to have that thing on the go but turns out it's not gonna happen so uh another game that uh may not run on switch we i think we've talked about this before uh you may have seen that the competition and markets authority or the cma filed a 418 page report to officially block the acquisition of Activision Blizzard by Microsoft. And part of that acquisition included Xbox entering into a 10-year legally binding agreement to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo consoles. And my thought process has long been that this was in an effort to kind of fend off Sony's assertion that Xbox was going to just take Call of Duty and bring it to just Xbox and PC. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, look, it's on more platforms than it was before. Uh, yeah, well, it turns out that was... Right? What was that? I said it's all posturing. Right? Yeah, probably. And, uh, you know, it turns out that this was actually a point of contention with the CMA because their report actually said, like, you know, again, it was a, a big 418 page report. This was a small excerpt from it. They said, quote, Nintendo does not currently offer Call of Duty, and we have seen no evidence to suggest that its consoles would be technically capable of running a version of Call of Duty that is similar to those in Xbox and PlayStation in terms of quality and gameplay and content. Hmm. So, um, you know, obviously there are more points made in the, the full report, but it seems like those plans might be at least on hold, if not completely dead in the water. It, uh, you know, Activision released a statement kind of countering it and saying they're going to keep, they, they want this acquisition to go through. I mean, I, I bet they do. And uh, obviously Microsoft wants it to go through. <laughs> so they changed their mind. You know what? We're good. <laughs> you know, you guys make good points. 
you know, if you actually read this, it's, it's, it's some good stuff in here. But no, they they are going to continue fighting it. But the CMA, which I believe is a uh, a British organization, is currently blocking it, and we'll see where it goes from here. But um, you know, I I didn't think that Call of Duty, as it exists on like PS5 and Xbox Series X, would run on Switch. But that doesn't mean that whatever like the next console is wouldn't be able to handle it. And I, I you know, we're probably coming up on the tail end of the Switch's life cycle, so like. Does it stand to reason that by the time this acquisition goes through, uh, that we'd have a new console at least announced by Nintendo? Gosh, maybe I don't it's like know. Like these things always I mean, move at a snail's pace. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with Switch, you know what they could release on Switch is just like a bunch of old Call of Duty games. You know, put Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare Two, Modern Warfare Three. They could, but like they were Xbox was coming out and saying like, "Hey, we're gonna have like." a version that is very comparable to other platforms running on switch. Yeah. Yeah. I like with like, so I don't know. I don't yeah, know what see. they were, uh, what, what the, the plan was there, or uh, maybe they have some inside information that like, Hey, there's going to be a new switch coming out. That's going to be like closer to the power of the series X and the PS five in two years or something. And they're like, Oh, well, by the time this thing goes through, that'll be at least announced. So who knows? But, yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I still think that thing's going through. You know, I think act, it, I, it, it's all just hurdles they need to jump over at this point, you know? Yeah, and turns out that money actually solves a lot of problems. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. <laughs> How about we actually, like, leave all this stuff about, like, you know, this isn't running on Switch, and this is not probably going to happen now or, or going to get delayed. Let's talk about a new game that was announced for Switch. Super Mega Baseball 4 was announced by... EA Sports this week, and uh, I don't know if you've played any of these games. Uh, you're a big sports guy, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, right after my Zelda lore guy title. It's sports. <laughs> Known sports guy, Kyle Hilliard. Yeah. Um, but it, this, I think that if you were to get into like a like a, a sports game, this would be a good one to play because it's like very arcade style. Yeah, that that's about my line. You know, like me, I dabbled with NBA Street and NBA Jam. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was about the deepest i ever got into like any kind of sports game and I'm, and maybe this is kind of close to that right i'm trying to bring up the name of because like they had like up until this point you know the first three entries were developed independently by a studio called metalhead software and now they've changed their name to metalhead studio and they were acquired by electronic arts shortly after super mega baseball 3 came out and they're like oh well, now it's going to be published by ea and you know, of course, everybody immediately goes to, the, oh, my God, there's going to be microtransactions and all this other stuff. But it actually turns out that it's not going to be. Hmm. And up to this point, they've only had, like, fake players. Like, they've just been like, okay, you could, like, here, we have a bunch of, like, fake teams and fake players. You can customize them however you want. So, like, if you want to take the time to go in and create rosters of, like, the current Major League Baseball, you can if you really want to. Oh, okay. But, like, here are some, like, here's one of the names. So, there's two cover stars on this one because one of the big announcements was that that EA's resources were actually going to allow them to have 200 or more legends from uh, baseball, like real life baseball in the game. So there are two cover stars. One is David Ortiz, former Red Sox, a uh, absolute legend in Boston and a uh, super mega baseball veteran hammer long ballo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the tone we're going for, but <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's um it gives me big like ken griffey jr major league baseball on um on super nintendo vibes in terms yeah, of like, all right the, i remember that game yeah. yeah that was that was a fun game um but yeah it, new presentation upgrades a way to make custom leagues full of legendary players you can even like have them on teams based on like their era that they came from so that's kind of cool and then like a, a special type of draft where you can draft like players from different eras and like even like the fake players to create like kind of like a mixed team of like real life legends and fake players so Seems like they're doing some pretty cool stuff, and the game itself is very fun. I've not poured a bunch of time into it, but like as a fan of like this style of baseball games from like back in the day, I uh, I'm definitely going to check out this game when it comes out. And it's cool that it's coming to Switch. I believe uh, ba Super Mega Baseball Three came to Switch as well when it came out. Okay, in 2021, I think. But yeah, it comes out June second. They just announced it, and uh, yeah, so we have less than a month to wait for that one. Um, but yeah. That is all the news that we're going to cover on this episode. We're going to take a break, and when we get back, we're going to be doing a primer of the canonical lore of the Legend of Zelda series to get you ready, hopefully, for the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. We will be right back after this brief musical interlude. In 
case you haven't heard, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom arrives on Switch just one week from today. And since it sits at the tail end of the Legend of Zelda timeline, we're going to try to recap that timeline and get us through the entire canon here in kind of a Cliff Notes version, talking about all the events that are leading to this game. Kyle, you are a big, dumb Zelda nerd. What fascinates you so much about this? The timeline? Yeah, like the timeline, the kind of the, the long, canonical, confusing lore of this series. I I really genuinely do love it. I There are people who, I don't think they're wrong even necessarily, that they're just kind of like, uh, it, it kind of, it's all s- stupid because it was clearly not a plan from the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's fair. I think that's like a totally fine stance to take. But I love that they do connect them like officially right it's not just like fan speculation like nintendo has said canonically like yes this is how these games line up like we have it's sure the story might have been retroactive we might have sort of come up with it later but it does apply and it is true and and that is because there was a long period of time where it wasn't acknowledged by nintendo and there was like it was a big secret and they wouldn't talk about it you know yeah and uh, and then I think it was Hyrule Historia, right? It was like that was the first time that they actually acknowledged it and said, "Okay, here it is, and this is what it is." And yes, you know, there is a canonical sort of timeline. And then Breath of the Wild is the one that maybe was the most sort of acknowledging of it in all mm-hmm. the series because it had so many ties and references back to other Zelda games in it. I guess maybe maybe you could say Skyward Sword because that was the first one that they actually said like this one's first right or was it that mm. was where is skyward sword after minish cap or is minish cap skyward first? sword is first okay skyward sword is officially first and and that was kind of i think that one of the first instances of them sort of like leaning into it and acknowledging it and i love it and it's 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 always subtle background stuff for super fans it's never front and center it's not like a main part of any zelda game since they've really started acknowledging it it's just fun additional context for for people like me who have sort of religiously played every zelda game uh at release you know and you know 2011 which was when hyrule historia came out which is by the way the one of the it's the primary thing that i'm going to be referencing over the course of this entire segment um primarily using that and creating a champion which was kind of like a a art book slash lore thing they put out focused purely on breath of the wild those are the 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 two primary sources that i'm using both those are official releases from nintendo so it's coming straight from them um, but Hyrule Historia was not technically the first time that they referenced that there was kind of this split timeline during, I believe it was an interview for Twilight Princess back when it was first coming out. Somebody asked Aonuma like where this happens in relation to Wind Waker. And he said something along the lines of like, oh, it happens in parallel. So mm, like, okay, he was, th- that seems like that's like the first time they ever referenced kind of like the split or the diverging timelines, which we're going to get into uh, here in a little bit. But I do want to say like, you know, it's a big old tangled web. We're going to try to do our best to untangle it here um, in a kind of efficient manner, but it is going to be a long segment, I think. Uh, But we should preempt this by saying that this is going to have spoilers for the entire series to this point. Not, not tears of the kingdom, no spoilers for that, obviously. Right. But if you have some games that are still on your to play list and you want to go in without any knowledge of the plot, uh, proceed with caution. That's that's all I'm trying to say here. Um, and I guess add another warning. A few of these games, including this very first one that we've already referenced here, are way more important to the overall timeline than others. So we'll be spending a little bit more time on them. So don't worry when I go super in depth on this early stuff, because that's all you know establishing the foundation for the rest of the timeline. Uh, but any last thoughts before we dive into this this beast of a a, a timeline? Uh, no, no, let's do it. I will. There was, this is a weird thing to shout out, but I actually never really considered the timeline very much until like 2008 or 2009. I think it was game trailers, uh, which is now a lot of folks over at easy allies put together this really fantastic like video Mm -hmm. that was sort of detailing all the, at the time, uh, fan speculation. And I loved that video and I watched it multiple times and it, cause it really blew my mind. And like, for the most part, like, they were spot on like what Nintendo eventually, um, you know, uh, confirmed was like they had it right, you know, and that that was just, that just made it all the more fun to me, you know, that that the the speculation from everyone kind of got confirmed, which is not something that happens very much, I feel like. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting to see Nintendo actually embrace what seems like, oh, well, people were talking about this stuff. Let's just say, yeah, they're right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that may not have been what happened. Maybe they did have sure this plotted simple, out. But yeah. Um, but yeah, let's let's kick it off right here. We've not a moment to waste here. Uh, it starts off with the creation. The world is created by three goddesses, Din, the goddess of power, Nehru, the goddess of wisdom, and Feror, the goddess of courage. And they left the world after they created it, leaving the Triforce behind, which consists of three golden triangles, one representing each goddess and their domain. And they left it in the care of the goddess Hylia. And uh, the legend says that whoever possesses the full Triforce can have any wish that they want. But if someone who doesn't have the three virtues of power, wisdom, and courage touches it, the three pieces split apart uh, with the finder only keeping the one piece that personifies them and the other two pieces appearing on the hands of people chosen by the goddesses. And though it's and, not in the first in the timeline, Ocarina was the one that sort of explained that, right? Correct. Yeah, right. that was like the, the Ocarina had a, like the, the, a lot of establishing lore dump, and this info is gathered from all around the Zelda world and kind of compiled in this segment right here. So, right. hopefully, in chronological order where possible. Um, but after the the Triforce splits up, the the person who had it can still seek down those, seek out those other two pieces of the Triforce and then reunite them and get his, get his or her wish, regardless of the initial kind of like rejection of their possession of it. So that's just kind of one establishing thing for the entire series, really. Um, but the first era that we have here is called the era of the goddess Hylia and the sky era. And uh, as you might imagine, that includes skyward sword and, um, basically there's this creature named demise and he had all of his troops gathered around and, uh, Hylia gathered the surviving humans as demise tried to take over the world, um, and then elevated them up into the sky. And then Hylia fought alongside the remaining tribes that were still on the surface to try to beat demise and seal him away. And in order to do that, Hylia actually had to renounce her godhood since only mortals can wield the Triforce, which is what she had to use to seal Demise away. And um, then she left Impa and the Sheikah to watch over the seal of Demise when she died because, you know, she's no longer a goddess. And um, there was a legend that came out of this that says that Demise is reborn in each era and looks different to each person who sees him. And his ultimate goal is to obtain the Triforce in order to use the power to get a wish to take over the world. And so that, um, that to me says that because like there's always that s split where people are like, oh, no, Demise and Ganon are two different things. But that almost to me reads like, well, no, they are the same thing, right? It's, it's kind of confusing. It is very confusing. Um, I, I, the way I've always interpreted it is like Demise is like kind of the, the spirit or the force that kind of possesses Ganondorf, right? The evil. Right. The, yeah. yeah, the the evil that the the blade that we're going to talk about at length here um, kind of is meant to banish. Right. And like Demise is kind of like the driving force and Ganondorf almost feels like the vessel of it. Right. Right. Um, that, that's the way I've always interpreted it anyway. But like the part that Hylia ended up sending up to the sky becomes known as Skyloft and only a few survivors on the surface even knew of its existence because she installed a thick cloud barrier that was separating the two worlds. And then after the people that were on the, the, the ground died, it just basically became like a legend that was told throughout the generations. And yeah, then that's the fun thing about Skyward Sword is you fall to the ground and people are like, what the, you're, 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 there are people up there. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, eventually the seal that locked Demise away began to weaken and there was a girl named Zelda born on Skyloft and she was considered the reincarnation of Hylia. And around this time, Demise sent his follower, uh, I'm always terrible at pronouncing this, Girahim, Girahim to the surface. Yeah. And uh, Girahim brought an army of demons and tried to resurrect Demise. And then when he discovered Zelda in Skyloft, he sent a tornado through the clouds and made her fall to the surface Zelda was captured by Girahim and uh, his minions, the Bacoblins. And then Impa actually was there to save her. And then after those events, a hero named Link followed Zelda down to the surface, accompanied by, is it Fee or Fi? Uh, Fee. I always said Fee, but I don't remember if it's ever spoken in the game or not. 
um, which is the spirit of the sword. And she talks Link, a lot. Like she has a she, lot to say, <laughs> especially in the original version. Didn't they oh, like yeah. temper they it down a little bit? Back, yeah. Or made it easier. In the HD yep. version. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Link has the goddess sword and he keeps getting these sacred flames that get sucked into it. And that ultimately allows him to use these flames to turn it into the master sword, which that is the creation story of the master sword. And Link proves he's worthy of the Triforce and then uses a wish to restore the goddess statue. And then Girahim kidnaps Zelda and takes her to the past to perform a ritual to resurrect Demise. Link follows and defeats Dem or Girahim and saves Zelda, but it's too late. And then Link must fight and defeat Demise. So a uh, cool boss fight with lightning. <laughs> so after the defeat of Demise... Uh, his hatred was absorbed and sealed into the Master Sword, and that uh, bought them enough time to return the citizens of Skyloft to the surface, which they began referring to as Hyrule. And that kicked off a never-ending cycle where the Demon King would be reborn with a hatred for those with the blood of Hylia and the spirit of the hero. So that's kind of laying the foundation right there, right? Like, that yeah. that is everything that, like, we have learned about the Zelda franchise whether it's you played Ocarina of Time, you played A Link to the Past, you played Twilight Princess, that laid the foundation for so much that happens in the series. And of course, this came out in 2011, so several decades after the series even started. But this was like an origin story of so many different parts of yeah. the Zelda franchise. It's funny because it is kind of a divisive Zelda. Like it's if you're if you're sort of a, a casual Zelda fan, there's a good chance you skipped Skyward Sword just because maybe you didn't like the controls or something like that. But it is like for the larger Zelda picture, it is like colossally important. Like oh, probably absolutely. the most important. That's why we spend so much time on it. We're going to try to go through some of these that are less important a little bit quicker. But uh, after that happened, there was the era of chaos. And this was the sacred realm being sealed. So after many years of peace, everybody started just fighting over the Triforce. <laughs> so uh, Raru, who is the Sage of Light, built the Temple of Time to house the only existing entrance to the Sacred Realm. And Raru put the Triforce in the Temple of Light and then sealed the Sacred Realm behind the Master Sword, which he placed in a pedestal in the Temple of Time. And then the keys to open it were spiritual stones that were entrusted to the Kokiri, Goron, and Zora people. So... Um, there is kind of setting some groundwork if you've played uh, Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Um, and then next up was the Era of Prosperity, where the descendants of Princess Zelda established Hyrule Kingdom, and then they built Hyrule Castle at the center of Castletown to protect both the Triforce and the Temple of Time. And then the royal family, just for whatever reason, just kept repeatedly naming their daughter Zelda. It's and a good it name. Out, to it be turned fair. out a bunch of them had special powers, and apparently Robin Williams was also one of those people <laughs> because yeah, right. He named his daughter Zelda. Um, but yeah, so that that was kind of a recurring theme: is the daughters were not only named Zelda, but also they kept being born with these special powers. Um, and then that brings us to the Force Era, which is where the Minish Cap takes place. So uh, several years of peace happened, and. Uh, Suddenly, the world's flooded with these evil beings. And then the Picori, who are these tiny beings that came from the sky, helped the hero of men, it said, uh, seal these beings away. And they left a Picori blade, which is a sword used by Link, in the care of the royal family. And then the only chance to see that blade was if you like went to this Picori festival that only happened every hundred years, and then you won the sword fighting tournament. And at one of these festivals a guy named vati who is a sorcerer won the sword fighting uh, tournament and then while he was doing the, the the winning ceremony uh he broke the blade when he got close enough because he thought that it would release the light force that the pakori used to seal away all the monsters and it didn't but uh instead vati used his sorcerer power to turn zelda into stone and then he went in search of the light force yeah, so, I, yeah, just just experience that because I just replayed Minish Cap when it came to Switch. So. Oh, that's right. It is on the Game Boy Advance uh, collection, right? Yeah. And you know how you save Zelda in the end of that game, Brian? You I hit her with your sword. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Link and Ezlo, who is the titular Minish Cap, uh, he was also one at one point Vati's ma uh, master. So they go on a quest together to recover 
these four elements that will open the path to the light force that Vati was going after. And uh, during this time, Vati took control over the King of Hyrule and ordered the troops to search for the light force. And then uh, Vati kind of did the old evil mastermind playbook because he waited for Link to just collect all the, the elements and then he was going to steal them. And then he Link got the four elements turned and turned the Picari sword into the four sword, which let him make four identical copies of himself. And then Vati followed Link to the light's force. And then uh, he turned into Vati's wrath. And then Link used the four swords to defeat him. And uh, it brought Hyrule Castle down around them. So it's a uh, pretty intense battle. But Ezlo gave Zelda the Mage's Cap, which let her use some of the Light Force power. And she used that to restore Hyrule to its form before the conflict. So that was uh, the Minish Cap, a game you most recently played. Is there anything that we really missed in that? Because you were the one that uh, just experienced that story. No, I mean, the, the big uh, quote unquote twist to that game is like Vadi is the bad guy man you defeat body right there's not like you know he's not really trying to summon ganondorf or anything you know he's just like maybe that would have been a long-term plan that he just never got around to but i always thought that was kind of interesting about minish cap is like it's uh you know it's it's just a there's a bad dude that you gotta take on yeah and uh, the uh, baddest he, dude if you will the, <laughs> and he comes back so the very next game four swords uh, you know, we turned the Picori sword into the four sword and uh, this four sword was passed down through the generations of the royal family. And then one day the current Zelda went to go check on it and the seal broke on the sword and Vati escaped and uh, kidnapped Zelda. And a fairy came to Link and told him to draw the four sword and take on Vati to save Zelda. Link ended up defeating Vati and once again sealed him into the four sword, which was returned to Hyrule Castle once again. So... Like I said, some of these are a little bit quicker to <laughs> to talk through. Yeah. Um, but I always liked Four Swords and Four Swords Adventure, which is another part of this timeline, oddly enough. But uh, any thoughts on these before we get to arguably the most important game on the entire timeline? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I never beat Four Swords, actually. That's one of the ones I haven't finished. I, uh, I, I love those games, but I, I think I mostly just liked um, Four Swords Adventure is the GameCube one, right? Uh, yeah, and that's the other confusing thing. There's like the Game Boy one, and then there's the one that's included on the Game Boy Advance version of Link to the Past. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, but yeah, I never those those ones I never really got into, so I don't have a lot of insight on those. The I just like ones. the art style of the GameCube version in particular. Well, just it's the really, Wind Waker art style, right? I mean, it's the Wind Waker art style, but like the top down Zelda uh, gameplay. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, that is cool. Which always looked great to me. Um, so here we go. Let's let's strap in here because we are entering the era of the Hero of Time. So this is Ocarina of Time, obviously. And uh, basically, generations of war just ravaging Hyrule right now. And a woman flees to the Kokiri Forest and entrusts her child to the great Deku Tree. The Deku Tree uh, had this feeling that the child was probably going to play an important role in Hyrule's future. So he agreed to take him in. And uh, the King of Hyrule was like, all right, well, let, let, eventually we got to figure out this peace thing. So they did. He, he brought peace to everyone, including the Gerudo leader named Ganondorf. And Ganondorf came to the castle, swore loyalty to the kingdom of Hyrule. But in kind of the background, Ganondorf was secretly trying to gather the spiritual stones that were necessary to open the sacred realm to retrieve the Triforce. You may remember earlier, they were entrusted to the Kokiri, the Zora and the Gorons. And, uh, Princess Zelda had this prophetic dream that Ganondorf would uh, take over Hyrule and lead it into an era of darkness and that a boy led by a fairy could stop him. And around that time, the Deku Tree entrusted a fairy named Navi to Link, who was the boy that was dropped off by that woman uh, in the very beginning part of this. That's so I, I I had forgotten that detail, but that like Link has does you never see her, but Link does have a mother in Ocarina of Time, which is kind of an interesting thing that he doesn't yeah. usually have. Because I mean that's how he can leave the forest, right? Like if you're a true Kokiri, you're not able to leave the forest. And right. if you do, you age really rapidly. Well, I I remembered that he wasn't Kokiri, but the fact that yeah, that like there was a mother at least referenced, that's the thing that I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. You know? Yeah. And so the fairy tells Link, like, hey, you got to go talk to the great Deku Tree. And he gets there. And basically, after going through the dungeon, he learns that, hey, this guy came to came here looking for the spiritual stone. I refused. So he put a, a 
a spell on me and I'm going to die soon. And he gives Link the spiritual stone that Gandorf presumably, I mean, that, that's the, that's all the, all the writing on the wall tells you that that is who it yeah. was. Um, <clears throat> he gives Link the spiritual stone that he was trying to get from him and told him to seek out the other ones because he should be the one that opens the sacred realm, not Ganondorf. So Link goes on this quest and then uh, already in possession of that spiritual stone, he goes and talks to Zelda, who the Dick Tree told him to go chat with. And she told him about Ganondorf and uh, said she was actually the one that had told him to go get the spiritual stone. Sorry, I got my notes a little mixed up there. And then uh, after that, pull the master, sto- master sword from the stone that's in the Temple of Time. And then uh, while Link was doing that, Ganondorf attacked Hyrule Castle and Zelda and Impa fled on horseback. And then Zelda threw the Ocarina of Time to Link. And uh, that's another, that's one of the keys to the Sacred Realm. So Link goes ahead, opens the door of time with the Ocarina of Time and pulls the Master Sword. And that sent him forward seven years. But unfortunately, I, I, maybe Ganondorf was the one copying Vati because... He was waiting. He was waiting this whole time for Link to open that door because Ganondorf snuck in behind him, grabbed the Triforce, and then uh, was like, hey, thanks for opening the door, doing all the work for me. And uh, the Triforce deemed Ganondorf unworthy to wield the entire thing, which only let him let only left him with the Triforce of power. I mean, it's a good move, to be clear. That's like getting captured on purpose. You know, it's like a, it's a it's a good it's a good card to play. <laughs> yeah, you're not I'm not stuck in here with you. You're stuck in here with me. Exactly. That's basically what he's saying. Um, so Link is basically sealed away for seven years and, uh, Ganondorf basically just ran stuff. Like he, he just took over Hyrule Castle, took over Castletown. Yeah. He did a bad job. It's like not great. No, everything (laughs) sucks. Zombies in the street is terrible. There's there's re-deads just wandering the streets. Everybody was having a good old time in Castletown before this and not so much anymore. Everybody who survived Ganondorf's takeover fled to Kakariko village and, Suddenly, Link possesses the Triforce of Courage, so that's a good thing, I guess. And uh, Link goes around. Is, yeah. Link goes around, travels to the six temples to restore the six sages who can help him seal Ganondorf. And then it's revealed that Zelda, who was disguised as a character named Sheik the whole time, uh, is the seventh and final sage, and also in possession of the Triforce of Wisdom. So Link scaled Ganondorf's castle, faced off against him, defeats him. But Ganondorf uses his last remaining power to transform into a giant beast known as Ganon. And Link defeats him with the help of Zelda. And then Ganondorf's castle collapses around them. And the sages use their power to seal Ganondorf away, who has returned to his human form at this point. And uh, they put him in the sacred realm along with the Triforce of Power. And then after that, Zelda's like, yeah, it was kind of maybe a mistake to open up the door of time and let Ganondorf sneak in as well. (laughs) So what (laughs) she does... Yeah, my bad, guys. Sorry. So she sends, uh, you, she takes the Ocarina of Time from Link, plays it, sends him back to his childhood seven years prior. And is like, hey, go enjoy your life. You you sacrificed so much for us. So you earned here's it. where it gets confusing, right? Like that ended up creating all these different timelines. So it's split into three distinct paths. On the adult timeline where Link is sent back from, Now there's no hero of time there because he was sent back and Ganondorf is sealed away in a sealed like compartment of the sacred realm. That's one timeline on the child timeline. Link is sent back. So he exists in this timeline, the hero of time link and the sacred realm is left untouched and protected. So there's no Ganondorf sealed away in the sacred realm there. And then there's a third timeline where it becomes almost like this what if scenario where what if Ganon killed Link instead of losing to him at the end of the Ocarina of Time battle? Right. How do you feel about that third one? Um, I it's weird that I mean, because they could branch that off from Minish Cap. They could branch that off from Skyward Sword. But it's interesting. Yeah, what if Link Ocarina, lost to Demise? Yeah, I mean, I guess that just the world ends, I guess, at that point. But um, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's fun. Like alternate realities are like cool right now. You know, it's like a, it's a cool narrative device that a lot of uh, uh, movies and video games and TV shows are using. I think like. I, th- I talked about it recently on some podcasts, but like I was trying to pinpoint the sort of starting line and like Rick and Morty leans into it a lot. And then into the spider verse kind of made it mainstream. And it's like this, they were kind of doing this sort of subtly, you know, again, this isn't front and center storytelling for Zelda, but I, I do like 
that they kind of always played with this idea of like there are alternate realities where different things have happened based on the events of you know ocarina of time specifically which is like this in like a, you know my favorite zelda this important zelda game and in, in the canon of zelda so it's nice that it has such this this like the stamp of like this is where things get tricky is ocarina of time changes a lot about zelda in 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 mechanical ways from a gameplay perspective you know if you want to just like talk about it from like a technical way but also from a storyline way so like i'm into it like i like i like the kind of idea of all of it i just think it's weird that there's a canonical what if in this like it makes sense they're like all right link was sent back so there's no hero of time left in the adult era and then in the child era obviously his life continues on but it's weird that there's like a Oh, what if Link was ki- like? Why isn't there like a, a canonical timeline? Like, what if this random uh, Bacoblin killed Link? Like, it's just like very weird that like that is. Yeah. I mean, the of- I, right? Like in theory, th- that could exist, but it's not. Uh, there's not a video game based on it, right? There's That's where Hyrule series- Warriors comes into play, based- right? I mean, yeah. Gosh, <laughs> Hyrule Warriors. Jeez, I don't even know if I want to play with that. So that's not uh, canonical. So we're not going to get yeah, into that. God, but it's I, I really do not like the end of uh, the second Hyrule Warriors game. I was really bummed out by that. <laughs> that's a side tangent here. But uh, so let's dig into these timelines, these diverging timelines. This is where like people are like, really? There's like three prongs to this timeline. Up to this point, it has just been one straight line, right? Went Skyward Sword, Minish Cap. Uh, four swords and then right into ocarina of time so that's straightforward now it's where it gets confusing let's go into like what i consider the more canonical timelines first so these are the ones where ganondorf is defeated at the end of ocarina of time so let's do the trial the the child era first that's uh where it's the the original part of ocarina of time where link is sent back and he's a child again so yeah. the obvious next you one think he is remembers when- ocarina of time Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So Majora's like, Mask, he remembers the event of Ocarina of Time, and he knows that he spent time as an adult and stuff like that. Yeah, he's just the only okay. one who knows, right? Because, like... Okay. That's that's what I was kind of... That was my question. But, yeah, I think you're right. Like, like, he's the only one that remembers exactly what happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he goes back, and I, I assume everybody in the adult era remembers him as, like, this legend, but he just kind of vanished after that, after he saved them, you know? Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like the inverse of the child era where he knows and he he did all this stuff and he exists in this timeline, but nobody else knows that he did it because it it he prevented it from happening. Right. So uh, the Majora's Mask timeline is or this is where it starts off because it's Link returns to his original time. He seeks out Zelda like he did in the beginning of Ocarina of Time. But this time he tells Princess Zelda everything and Zelda gives Link the Ocarina of Time and tells him to go as far away as possible to prevent Ganondorf from getting his hands on the tool that he needed to open the Sacred Realm. Now, is that is that canon? Like, is Mm -hmm. that is that in the games or is that it's in Hyrule Historia? That's okay. That's okay. That was my question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's certainly not in the game. Like, in fact, it, like it's it's unclear exactly what he's doing at the beginning of Majora's Mask, right? You, he kind of it's like I think he's looking for Navi, but maybe he's looking for Zelda, right? It's like kind of well, according to Hyrule purpose. Historia, it is Navi. Okay, that's cool. Okay, yeah. I mean, so, I, I, it's, I guess I'm not being accurate here. It's like it's it's pretty obviously Navi, I guess. And mm-hmm. and right, if I remember, you played it more recently than I have. Yeah, he's just kind of wandering through this like mysterious woods and. Uh, he's on Epona. Epona? Epona? How do you say it? I say Epona, but like, I don't know if that's right. I've, I've always I've said Epona, Epona, but I've, I yeah. feel like I've been corrected enough times that say Epona. Yeah. But I like Epona. Let's stick with that one. And uh, they go into this mysterious forest and two fairies and Skull Kid uh, play a trick on Link and send him down into a pit, which uh, is a parallel world called Termina. And it turns out that Skull Kid is using this powerful mask that he stole from the Happy Mask Salesman. It's called Majora's Mask, and he's bringing the moon crashing into Termina. So basically, like, this apocalypse is impending, and Link uses the Ocarina of Time to reset this three-day time loop over and over and over again until he has gathered all the necessary pieces to stop Skull Kid and save Termina alongside Tattle, who was one of the fairies that uh, sent him to Termina in the first place, but they wanted to help him uh, stop uh, Skull Kid and Majora. And then after they stopped the moon from crashing in, Link goes up into the moon and defeats Majora using, uh, canonically, he uses the Fierce Deity Link transformation. Did you know that? Hmm. No, that's cool. 
So yeah, canonically, he gets this super powerful form, which is uh, just this strong spirit that's almost invincible and uh, defeats Majora using that. And then after Link saves Termina, he returns Majora's mask to the happy mask salesman and then wanders off. And then according to the Hyrule Historia, from that point on, his whereabouts were completely unknown. So like just nobody saw him again. Yeah. You know, what would be fun is a, a Majora's Mask sequel. Like, you know what I mean? Like, a yeah, game like there, I... like where because he does not find Navi in Majora's Mask. So yeah. it would be fun to kind of give that close that loop there. You know, I would love to just like have a third game that follows the rest of his life. Right. Like there would be so, so much cool stuff because like as we'll learn in uh, this next little section that he he had a full life. Right. Um, so. After that, after the events of that, uh, Zelda, you know, she's fully informed of Ganondorf's intentions. So she places him under arrest and has him executed. But his execution doesn't occur for many years after that. And when it does, he uses the Triforce of Power at the last minute to save himself. And then he kills one of the sages. And because Link returned from the future bearing the Triforce of Courage, that meant that Ganondorf couldn't get a hold of the full Triforce. And, uh because Link warned Zelda about the Sacred Realm, they didn't send him to the Sacred Realm. So the remaining sages decided to banish him to the Twilight Realm, which is locked behind a mirror, and he was there for, according to the Hyrule Historia, hundreds of years. Okay, so you're telling me that that scene in Twilight Princess, where Gandorf is being executed and there are the sages all around him, that takes place just a, like a, a couple years after Ocarina of Time? They said several years, but that's but yeah, like, that is what they lead like you within to a, the lifetime of Ocarina of Time. Like technically, while Ganondorf was attempting being executed, characters who were alive in Ocarina of Time were still there. That's what the Hyrule Historia led me to believe. That's very cool. I did not know that. Yeah, and it's interesting because he looks so different because the art style of Twilight Princess is obviously a very kind of more mature, but it it also explains why it's more of like a, a continuation or maturation of the Ocarina of Time art style, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Because um, that was, you know, when Wind Waker was shown and people didn't like the art style, everyone was like, well, we wanted something more like Ocarina. We wanted the natural evolution of Ocarina. So then mm -hmm. after Wind Waker, they're like, okay, fine, we'll do that. That's what you want. That's and we're really like, yeah, want. this game looks great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love the way Wind Waker looks too, to be clear. Yeah, 100%. Um, but Gandalf arrives in the Twilight Realm and he meets a guy named Zant, who wanted Zant. to be a king. Yeah, Zant and Zant. Girahim, like some all-time not Ganondorf Zelda villains. Love both those guys. Oh, for sure. And uh, But it turns out he wanted to be king of the Twilight Realm, but instead Midna, let me say that again because I, my voice cracked, Midna, a <laughs> very important character here, was installed as the ruler of the realm. And Ganondorf gave Zant magical powers to increase his influence, and Midna tried to stop him, but he put a curse on her, and she fled to the light world. And uh, Zant got an army behind him and launched a full-on invasion of Hyrule using the, the Twi'lei, who is the forces that he corrupted and kind of brought on his side. And Princess Zelda thought the best course of action was to surrender rather than have these overwhelming forces kind of do what they were threatening to do and burn the kingdom to the ground. So that's why we got to where we were in Twilight Princess. And Midna finds Link. And this is, by the way, this is one of the only times they mention this that this Link is of the bloodline of the Hero of Time. So the Link from Ocarina of Time had some kids, apparently, and this is one of his descendants, is the okay. Link in Twilight Princess. Cause, so that's not too surprising, because you do you learn new abilities from basically what you presume to be a long-past Hero of Time from Ocarina of Time. Oh, it's 100% the link yeah. from Ocarina of Time. Which I but, love you know, that. I think that is so him, cool. Yeah. When you see him, he is like, you know, he's got broken armor. He's wearing like a knight's outfit. Like he clearly saw some battles beyond what we saw in Ocarina of Time. That's why I would love to see like a continuation of his life and like just kind of like wrap up his story. Give us kind of like, I mean, I, I would hope it would be better than this game that I'm about to reference, but like Assassin's Creed Revelations. If you ever played that, Mm -hmm. You get to the end of that, and it's like a, a fitting conclusion to the life of Ezio. And I would love to see kind of like an older Link doing some stuff to, to save Hyrule. And older Link as in like the Link from Ocarina of Time, the Hero of Time Link. Right. Um, and I just think that would be a cool thing to continue. And yeah, and it, it makes sense that he would be of the bloodline because 
this the the hero of time kind of spirit that appears to the link in twilight princess i believe directly refers to him as son even if it's not like technically his son but like he refers to him as like a descendant of him mm. and so that's that's a really cool feature that or feature um uh what am i trying to say it's a really cool like tidbit of information that i didn't realize during uh during my playthrough of Twilight Princess initially, they're like, oh, that's the link from Ocarina of Time that's teaching me all this stuff. But like after I learned that, I'm like, what? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that is really cool. So uh, when the Twilight Realm kind of expands and consumes the light world, uh, Link takes the form of a wolf. He's not corrupted by uh, kind of the Twilight as much as everybody else, but he takes the form of a wolf. And uh, he goes around restoring the various parts of Hyrule and he regains his human form as well as a way to kind of travel back and forth between the realms. And Midna accompanies him on this entire adventure and Link goes and challenges Zant, but Zant defeats Link and nearly kills Midna. And then Zelda arrives and saves Midna and tells Link that he needs to seek out the Master Sword in the forest to have a chance uh, Zant breaks the Mirror of Twilight to free Ganondorf, and Link and Midna travel around to restore the Mirror, and uh, they end up defeating Zant, but Ganondorf was resurrected once again, and then Link began meeting up with uh, the spirit of his ancestor, as we mentioned before, and that gives him kind of like the moves to take on Ganondorf, and Ganondorf attacks Link, and then even at one point he possesses Princess Zelda, like that's which was kind of a very creepy moment in this. If you remember that yeah, fight, it is, it is interesting. It's cool, yeah. Um, but Link defeats uh, the Zelda possessed form, uh, his beast form, and then a one on one sword fight, which is a very cool multi part battle. Like there's a horseback section. There's like just like a full on like, hey, we're just throwing down in this circle, and ultimately Ganondorf gets the the master sword plunged into his chest and that removes the triforce of power from him and then zant appears as a phantom and in a very gruesome way snaps ganondorf's neck right yeah i forgot about which that, you know, everybody man. talks about another defeat of ganondorf as like particularly graphic for this series this one's pretty rough too yeah i the other one you're referencing i think has a lot to do with uh the art style that yeah. you've been experiencing that full game. And then suddenly where we're twilight princess is kind of dark throughout, but even that, even still it is kind of surprising when it does happen. Yeah. So this lifts Midna's curse and she returns to her true form. She was kind of like this, like impish looking creature for most of the game. And then she returns to like this, this majestic looking princess. And uh, she returns to the twilight realm to rebuild it. And she smashes the twilight mirror in order to ensure that the worlds never intersect again, because it, the Twilight had such a, a big impact on Hyrule that she's like, yeah, we probably shouldn't do that again. Yeah, I mean, but frankly, like I do, man, I, I would love to revisit it in some way in some future. It would be like a fun twist to have in a future Zelda game, you know, of like suddenly you're, you're, you're back in the Twilight Realm or something. I hope that happens someday. Or just like I've been saying almost every episode of this podcast since it started, Twilight Princess HD. That'd bring it over nice. to switch because I, when i was doing the research of this of this timeline episode i was like oh man i want to replay this so bad especially twilight prince that was the one where i was like yeah now that like majora's mask is fresh on my mind it would be cool to play this and just like, be like okay this is like a direct continuation of this game even yeah. though it's like you know hundreds of years down the line um but that leads us to four swords adventure this is one of the shorter ones here but a few hundred years pass and Hyrule and the Gerudo have actually become friendly again. I'm assuming they were kind of strained after Ganondorf did kind of what he did. And they were like, yeah, this uh, that's kind of leaving us a little bit sour on on the relations between our, our people. But they had become friendly again. And a uh, new Ganondorf was born, unfortunately, and snuck uh, into an ancient, yeah, and uh, snuck into an ancient pyramid and stole a trident and the dark mirror to turn Hyrule into a place of darkness. And then Ganondorf used his power to bring Shadow Link into Hyrule and then weakened the seal on Vati. So uh, Vati's back. So that is uh, Link goes and pulls the four sword from the the uh, castle, which was, you know, is being protected by the royal family. And when he did that, it released Vati. And it's like, OK, cool. Now we've got like this triple threat. So 
Link used the Four Sword to uh, gather Light Force again, and he defeated Vati and Ganon, sealing them both in the Four Sword. So that is the end of the Child Era timeline. Any thoughts on on that kind of uh, that thread that we just went through? Uh, probably the probably the thread I'm sort of most interested in and in sort of invested in between Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Just, I mean, it's just, it feels like the right timeline with like Link still existed and Ganondorf was kind of like executed from the information that Link gave Zelda when he went back in time. And it feels like, okay, this is like, we, we followed that Link to Majora's Mask and it's like, why not just keep following down that line, right? Right. So that brings us to the adult era. And the first era that happens here is called the era without a hero. And uh, so, you know, Zelda sent Link back to his child era, meaning there's no hero of time in the, the current age. This is seven years uh, later. Zelda ends up sealing Ganon in the sacred realm and ensures the sacred realm cannot be opened. And by, because she does that by putting the master sword back in the temple of time's pedestal and then locking the door of time. And this actually led to an era of peace within Hyrule, but then enough time had passed and people kind of began forgetting about the Legend of Hero of Time and uh, evil started kind of slowly creeping back in and Ganondorf eventually broke free and was gaining power in this era because there was no like hero to stop him. So King Daphnis made a kind of desperate decision as he realized that uh, Ganondorf was kind of un becoming unstoppable. And he entrusted the fate of Hyrule to the gods. And the gods decided that the best course of action would be to tell uh, select people in Hyrule to escape to the mountains. And then they flooded Hyrule in its entirety and then sealed Hyrule Castle and Ganondorf. And then the king broke the Triforce in two and he gave one piece to Princess Zelda. And then uh, she fled with her retainers. So that was kind of what happened in between the Ocarina of Time events and the next game, which is Wind Waker. So several generations passed, but Ganondorf, you know, he was sealed down underneath Hyrule, uh, underneath the, the flood. He still had the Triforce of Power and he finally escaped his seal at the bottom of the sea. And then he attacked the temples that were remaining on land. And then he began the search for Princess Zelda and the Triforce that she had and he had a new base called the Forsaken Fortress. And in the process, uh, Ganondorf actually kills some of the sages. So he had his minions going around and just looking for girls because he kind of caught wind that the uh, the king had disguised Princess Zelda as somebody else. So he started kidnapping girls of a certain age. And right. one of the girls yeah. was uh, someone named Aril, who is the younger sister of a boy named Link on this island called Outset Island. And this is what starts Link's journey. He eventually is like, oh, I got to go save my sister. And that it leads to him, you know, going around to all the temples. He, he kind of gets tangled up in the whole mess of Ganondorf and Hyrule. And uh, it eventually leads to him descending to the bottom of the sea to the sealed Hyrule Castle, which is an unbelievably cool scene if you've never played that moment. Like a, um, like a series highlight, honestly. Oh, it's so moment. cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, he gets the Master Sword, meets Princess Zelda, who she didn't even know this, but she was disguised as the pirate Tetra. And I guess there was a spell put on her that she was disguised as Tetra and to protect her identity from Ganondorf. Even she didn't know that it was the case. And then like the spell was broken and then uh, she kind of guides Link to the end of this and retrieve Link goes around, retrieves the, the broken Triforce pieces that are at the bottom of the sea which is the uh, most fun part of the game that we all uh, loved. <laughs> it's that's one of tedious. those, like, this game is so incredible. Why did you put this in here? Yeah. And they did it, if you listen to the Wind Waker episode, uh, largely because they ran out of time from the final temple that they wanted to put in. And uh, yeah, go listen to that episode if you want to learn more about Wind Waker's development. But Link goes around and establishes new sages, and then he challenges Ganondorf. And, you know, there's a whole sequence where you're, you're battling these puppets that Ganondorf has. And it's it's a pretty cool sequence there as you're trying to kind of scale up to to take on Ganondorf. Yeah, for sure. But during the final battle, Ganondorf actually realizes that, hey, both Zelda and Link are here, which means all three of the Triforce pieces are here. And he reunites them and then he goes to wish on the Triforce and the King of Hyrule surprisingly appears and touches the Triforce and like basically is like, hey. 
you flooded a lot of Hyrule. Just finish the job now. Let's let's get rid of this guy once and for all. Right. And so that happens. And then Princess Zelda uses her light arrows to weaken Ganondorf. And then Link jumps up in the air and plunges the Master Sword into Ganondorf's skull. <laughs> which is the one we were talking about is the other kind of gruesome defeat that Ganondorf suffers. It's very memorable. Yeah. And Ganondorf just turns to stone. And then according to Hyrule Historia, this successfully ended the cycle of Ganondorf's struggle for the Triforce and his kind of reign of terror over, over Hyrule. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. I never, that didn't occur to me that that was like a permanent kind of on that, along that path, you know, along that timeline. Yeah. And so there's uh Another game here that kind of wraps up this timeline, but first, the era of the Great Voyage. So after the events of Wind Waker, Zelda reassumed her role as Tetra and then went off in search of a new Hyrule with Link. And then they deal with this whole ghost ship nonsense and confront the evil dream god Bellum. But that's not important to the overarching story, so we're just kind of mentioning that and moving on. But Link and, discover, Link and uh, Tetra discover a new continent, which they found as the new kingdom of Hyrule. Did you did you say that the, you're talking about Phantom Hourglass, the DS sequel to Wind Waker? I don't know if you said the name of the game. Yeah, so that is Phantom Hourglass. Apologies there. I did okay. not say that, um, but you are correct. So Phantom Hourglass, and then actually there is one more game, Spirit Tracks, which this is, uh, you know, the new Hyrule is trying to expand. And they do so by starting a railroad system across the continent, you know, much in the way that the uh, the U.S. kind of tried to expand. Uh, yeah, and Spirit Tracks is not, and Phantom Hourglass is, you know, one of the few direct sequels in the Zelda canon, right? So, like, mm -hmm. you are playing as the Link from Wind Waker in Phantom Hourglass. But Spirit Tracks, we're jumping a, a ahead a couple hundred years again, right? And it's Correct, a yeah. Generation, right? So yeah. this is about a hundred years after the founding of New Hyrule. And the tracks mysteriously start to vanish. So the new Princess Zelda and an engineer named Link <laughs> go out to investigate. And they meet this guy named Cole, who is attempting to resurrect another demon king at that point. And his name is Maladus. And Cole planned on using Zelda's body as a vessel, which that this whole process separates Zelda's... For Zelda. Keeps happening to her. It really does. Yeah. So this separates her body and her soul. And her soul goes with Link on his journey to kind of stop this plan. And uh, Link and Zelda eventually defeat Maladus, and the land of Hyrule was once again entrusted to Link, Zelda, and their people. So that is the end of the adult timeline. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, Spirit Tracks is like um, kind of, you know, I don't know. It's pretty low on the sort of totem of Zelda games, but it does. It, the one thing going for it is that it's like probably the game that you spend the most time with a Zelda in. Like she is with you the whole game. She is like the equivalent of Navi in Spirit Tracks, which is kind of nice. Yeah. But uh, no, that's interesting. I didn't realize that 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 kind of canonically Ganondorf is like is is truly defeated in that timeline. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see if that re remains, uh, you know, in the future. But, uh, <laughs> that's that's cool. I didn't realize that because he's still like in the other in the timeline with Majora's and Twilight. Like he's he's still as he was not fully you know taken care of right yeah i mean he was just sealed in the uh the the realm or he was he was killed in twilight princess but you know after ocarina he was sealed in the realm of twilight right but it seems like uh zant kind of finished the job that link started right right so uh oddly enough the de the defeated timeline or as they call it the decline of hyrule and the last hero which we're doubling the... back is like if Link lost in Ocarina of Time is basically yes. the idea. Right? So Ganondorf kills Link and obtains all three pieces of the, the Triforce. And then he becomes Demon King Ganon and plunges Hyrule into chaos and war for generations. And as a last resort to save what's left of Hyrule, the seven sages seal Ganon and the Triforce in the Sacred Realm. But uh, turns out that doesn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but yeah, so this is this is the final of the three branches of the timeline. And oddly enough, like I'm I'm very surprised that like this is again the, the kind of the what if scenario. It's maybe the longest of the timelines. And um the first part is the era of light and dark. This is a link to the past, so one of the greatest games of all time, for what it's worth. But uh basically there's a brief time of peace and people began trying to obtain the Triforce. And they realize, oh, it's in the sacred realm. So they keep trying to open the sacred realm. However, at they unbeknownst to them, the sacred realm had been corrupted by Ganondorf's evil heart. And it turned the sacred realm into the dark world. 
And as right, a result, a bunch right. of demons escaped into Hyrule and the sages had to seal the sacred realm so tight that it could never be reopened again. So uh, that's kind of setting the stage for a Link to the Past. But thanks to the power of the Triforce and the uh, waning of the Hylian bloodline, so, you know, like the, the power that Zelda was being born with year after year after year, generation after generation, uh, it was starting to wane a little bit because I guess they're so far removed from it. There's no Triforce anymore in this world. Um, and there was an evil that did come out on top at some point. Right? Yes. That didn't help, I'm sure. So a sorcerer named Aghanim kidnapped those who had the blood of the seven sages, including a new princess Zelda, and sacrificed all of them, um, except for Zelda, to open the seal. Because before he could get to Zelda, she called out for help and wakes up a young boy named Link. Imagine that. And he goes to Hyrule Castle and learns that, uh, you know, what's going on. And he goes on a quest to save Hyrule. He defeats Aghanim. And then uh, he also seeks out the Master Sword in the process in the Lost Woods. And ultimately, he after he beats Aghanim, you're like, oh, cool. Like, I remember being a player of this game. And be like, oh, the game's over. And he's like, nope, you're going to the Dark World. And that's what happens to Link. And uh, Link basically goes around, saves the Maidens to prevent further expansion of the uh, the door to the Dark World which, you know, those are the sages that were being sacrificed and then defeats Ganon, who has been resurrected by Aghanim. And, uh, you know, he's he's in the, the, the basically what was the sacred realm that he was sealed in. It's the dark world now. So that's why Link is needing to fight Ganon in this timeline again. And uh, Link touches the Triforce and wishes for the world to return to the state of peace and the people who had been killed to be restored, which, you know, remember his uncle is killed very early on in this game. And so his uncle is among the people that are restored. And then uh, Ganondor or Ganon is defeated. And then the dark world fades away. So, yeah, that's the story of one of the greatest games of all time. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads us to the Oracle games. So the Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. And uh, basically Twin Rova, who is a pair of witches who raised Ganondorf, they plan to resurrect him because, you know, that's just what you do nowadays, I guess. And they were in... Ocarina, right? They were. Yeah, they were one of the bosses um, of one of the temples. So this is like a different reality, a different timeline version of Twin Rope. Yeah. Yes. So Link uh, goes across, engages in various trials, gains the aid of three oracles to stop the resurrection. But unfortunately, they were not completely successful because Link fights and beats Twin Rova, but they successfully resurrect Ganon. But they didn't finish the the ceremony or the, the the sacrifices or whatever they needed to do. So while Ganon is back in in body, he's not fully there in mind. So he's just kind of like this unintelligible beast. But he's still like a powerful enemy. But uh, Link defeats him and stops him from taking over taking over Hyrule. Uh, so that is the Oracle games and like as far as like what canon is important to carry forward. And then uh, Link, this is. Uh, Link returning to Hyrule and uh, his boat gets caught in a storm and he washes up on Koholint Island. This is Link's awakening. Right. So real quick, Link to the Past, Link, Oracle of Ages and Season Link and Link's Awakening Link are all the same Link? That is what I'm led to believe by the Hyrule okay. Historia. Got it. So uh, this one doesn't have a whole lot of weight and bearing on the canon. It's a very good game, but uh, we can glance over it a little bit. But it turns out the island is just a big, big old dream of the Windfish. And in order for Link to escape, he needed to wind or he needed to wake the windfish up. And uh, he gathers all these instruments of the sirens, wakes up the windfish, and it defeats or it destroys uh, Koholint Island. So, yeah. like, Link and the saved final all these boss people. has like Ganondorf silhouette, right? But then you can kind of interpret it as like, you know, Link just sort of it's in his head to a certain degree, right? A lot of dream stuff going on in this game. Yeah. But yeah, like it's it's interesting because like in doing this, like he saved Hyrule a couple times at this point, but in doing this, he ends up destroying an entire island with people and stuff on it. Who may or may not have truly existed. It's exactly. all it's up for but interpretation, like, right? <laughs> hey, what does it mean to exist? If you have a, a consciousness Whoa. and oh my god. Uh but okay. <laughs> anyway, next let's up, not worry about it. <laughs> hey, good news. The next era is called the golden era. Basically the modern the golden cartridges. Yeah. Oh, hey, there you go. But basically, Ganon's defeat in A Link to the Past uh, led this kind of tradition to the kings of Hyrule using the Triforce to preserve peace. And this goes on for generations and generations and generations. 
And one king eventually gets worried that like, hey, like I used it for peace, but what if there was a king of Hyrule that ends up using it for uh, for nefarious means or somebody gets their hands on it? So he actually hides the Triforce of Courage and then uh, this puts a spell on Hyrule that will allow for a worthy person to claim it once they reach a certain age and experience level. So he entrusted the Triforce of courage to his daughter zelda in secret and so that's that's kind of the golden era there and then that leads directly into the a link between worlds and um there's a sorcerer named yuga appearing in hyrule and he transforms the descendants of one of the sages series into a painting okay hey, i want to check in but I, I, this is like my question that i keep asking link between worlds different link then i believe the a different link? link okay we're, we're a couple same world right because it is like it is technically linked to the past too but we're, we're jumping ahead a couple generations okay oh definitely yeah this is uh kind of farther in the future like i said like generations of kings have passed right so we're far in the future it's still the same hyrule as linked to the past but it's a different link right so link hears about this guy yuga who transformed this sage into a painting and he goes and tries to fight Yuga and he loses and a merchant named Ravio offers to help him and Link visits Princess Zelda who tells him he needs and to- And Ravio's straightforward guy, no secret identity or anything. <laughs> He's like just a cool dude who wants to help you out. Yeah, 100%. No ulterior motives or anything. And uh, Zelda tells Link that he needs to gather the three pendants to be able to wield the Master Sword. Link does that. He defeats Yuga, but he is transformed into a painting. But uh, Ravio had... What was that? I said, that's how they get you. That is how they get you. And uh, Ravio gave him a bracelet before this, though. And the curse is actually contained in the bracelet. And that allows Link to kind of control it so he can merge with walls to turn into a painting at will. And that allows him to to slip between uh, this... The Hyrule and then this parallel dark twin world of Hyrule called Low Rule, which is you know, a fun little name. And uh, Yuga's plan is to use the captured sages to resurrect Ganon, because of course. And uh, Low Rule is ruled by Princess Hilda instead of Princess Zelda. And Link rescues the seven sages in Low Rule. And then uh, the, the old Zelda villain trope happens where Hilda let Link do all the work, and then she ends up betraying Link and steals Hyrule's Triforce. And because it yeah, turns she out... She good Triforce. She's t- fed up with bad... Or she wants good Hyrule. She's fed up with bad Hyrule. Yeah, so Low Rule was kind of like, almost like their version of the Dark World. It's very, very similar to the Dark World. And it turns out that Low Rule used to be kind of like a peaceful version of this this world. But her ancestors destroyed Low Rule's Triforce, thinking that like, oh, well, you know, maybe instead of hiding it like the, the kings in Hyrule did, we should just destroy it and make it so nobody can get a hold of it. But that ended up plunging Low Rule into darkness. And it turns out that she's the one who sent Yuga to set, to steal the Triforce. But once Hilda had the Triforce, Yuga betrayed Hilda and stole the Triforce for himself. Uh, Link stops him. Ravio reveals himself to be the Low Rule version of Link, basically. <gasps> But he was too kind of like... I really didn't see it coming at the time, genuinely. He was kind of like too cowardly to face all the stuff, so he escaped to Hyrule. And then they all use the Hyrule Triforce to restore the Low Rule Triforce, and then Link and Zelda return to Hyrule. All right. So that is... uh, We're we're getting to the end of this timeline, and then uh, we'll wrap up with the the final piece of this puzzle. But first, Kyle, we got to talk about the tragedy of Princess Zelda. That is how it is officially labeled in the Hyrule Historia. Mm. But uh, once the king... Hold on. Yeah, Did you skip Triforce Heroes? We're skipping Triforce Heroes. Okay. I mean, there's not much to say. We can touch on it briefly. It it seems to be the same Link as Link Between Worlds, who's just kind of on a side adventure in a different world. He's off adventuring. He had to save a princess, you know, from from not even a Ganondorf, but some kind of evil, you know. I would say maybe the least impactful mainline zelda game to the entire lore of zelda yeah yeah probably even majora's mask probably has more implication just because of who it stars yes i agree yeah um, I just, uh you know we gotta be thorough here i get them all fair um so the tragedy of princess zelda so once the king passed away the new king didn't inherit the full power of the triforce and he was trying to figure out why and you may remember that uh the last king gave princess zelda the tri the part of the triforce in secret and 
the the new king's confidant, a wizard, heard that Zelda might know something about what's going on with the Triforce. He just didn't know like how much she knew about it. So the new king told this wizard to find Zelda and interrogate her. But after she said nothing, he lost his temper and the <laughs> wizard put a sleep spell on her. So she had to sleep forever, basically. And uh, the new king was kind of distraught about this, obviously. And he put the sleeping Zelda on an altar and then in honor of Zelda decreed that all girls born to the royal family from then on must be named Zelda in honor of this Zelda. So that's like Which a canonical is, is it reason. coincidental that there had been so many Zeldas. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's, it's like at the end of the timeline. It's like, and from now on, everyone should be called Zelda. It's like, yeah, no, we've been keeping up with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we okay. That's like me saying like, all right, every morning I have to wake up and brush my teeth. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I've been, been doing, doing that, that anyway. Oh, uh, well, we're good. Um, so only the Triforce of Wisdom is being passed down through the kings at this point, And then that led the kingdom of Hyrule to fall into decline. And uh, that leads us into the original Legend of Zelda. And guess what? Wouldn't you know it? Ganon was once again resurrected and he invaded Hyrule and stole the Triforce of Power. Go That's figure. That's how it happens, man. That's how it happens. So uh, to prevent him from getting his hands on the Triforce of Wisdom, the reigning Princess Zelda, so this is a new Princess Zelda, not the sleeping one, divided the Triforce of Wisdom into eight pieces. And this made Ganon mad. So he kidnapped Zelda and sent his followers after Impa. Impa barely escaped and uh, is saved by a boy named Link and Link informs or Link is informed that what's going on. And he goes on a quest to gather the shards of the Triforce of Wisdom and defeat Ganon. And uh, Link defeats Ganon, saves Zelda, but Ganon's minions remained in Hyrule and just basically lay waste to Hyrule. And then they launch a plan to resurrect Ganon one more time, which leads directly into Zelda to the adventure of Link. And uh, this is six years after Link defeated Ganon. They the, well, they they have that number, huh? Six years. So. Six years. So Link is. How old do you think Link was in the original Legend of Zelda? Dear, uh, I think he's supposed to be a kid, right? He's ten years like old. Ten. I was gonna guess ten because I think I used to joke about it with my own kid that I was like, "Oh, you're ten. It's time to get kicked out of the house with a sword and a shield. <laughs> Dangerous to go alone, you know." Yeah. Um. So the Triforce crest now appears on the now 16-year-old Link on his hand. And uh, Link tells Impa about this. And Impa takes him to see the sleeping Zelda, who is uh, still at that altar. Which is like and kind of kind of almost like a twist for Zelda 2, right? Is like at the beginning of the game, the beginning of Zelda 2 was when you learned there was a sleeping Zelda this whole time. Mm -hmm. right? So there's two yeah. Zeldas it's alive it's in the cool. world at this point. I like that. It's very weird. But anyway, Link, again, this is not super impactful on the overall timeline, but Link overcomes all these different trials, including a showdown with Shadow Link. And then he uses the Triforce of Courage to awaken the sleeping Zelda. And this ultimately prevents Ganon's resurrection. So there we go. That is the defeated timeline. <clears throat> and uh, that concludes our look at the three divergent timelines. And that, that also concludes the Hyrule Historia segment of this. Then there's a final component of this. Do you have any thoughts before we move on to this final component? No, I want to talk about the final component. So I don't know if it's actually considered this, but I call it the convergence, but uh, it's mostly referred to as the great calamity. And uh, this is the part of the timeline that is breath of the wild. And this takes place so far in the future, so far in the future. It's like, the entire timeline that we've covered to this point, every other Zelda game in history is just referred to in the chronology of Breath of the Wild as the distant past. And here's what the, the Creating a Champion book has to say about that entire timeline that we just said. It's called The Era of Myth. And it's called, it says, quote, The kingdom of Hyrule flourishes under the Hyrulean royal family. Ganondorf, king of the Gerudo, transforms into Dark Beast Ganon and threatens Hyrule. The princes of Hyrule and the chosen hero combine their power to seal Ganon in a seemingly endless cycle of darkness and light. Ganon continues to be revived and then sealed away. That's basically what we just talked about distilled into everything that everybody knows basically right. about all those games, because this is so far in the future that all that is just like a legend of a bygone era at this point. Yeah. Which is like, we're getting into breath of the wild here, right? Like, yeah which is something I love about breath of the wild that like 
there's so many like little nods and hints and stuff to past games and like my favorite of that are like names of places are like misspelled versions of like characters and things and i love the idea that it's just been so far removed that they don't even really truly know what the sort of original thing was you know i I do love that too it's like when you see like these things like oh there's this legendary character called this and it's like there's a tingle island but tingle is misspelled so it's like okay they, they knew there was this thing it's like kind of how like uh, to draw a reference or draw a parallel to like the Bible where it's like, there's all these different translations of uh, or all these different versions of the Bible where it's like, okay, well this in this version, it's, it's said this way in this version, it's said this way. Yeah. It's almost yeah. how like these legends would be passed down in this world. And I, that's, that's just something I adore about breath of the wild is it's just, it's all sort of a uh, sort of legend that cannot be confirmed in any way. Uh, everything leading up to it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, We'll, I mean, there's so many details that we could go into with the Breath of the Wild era here, but like, just let's talk about some of like the pertinent stuff here. Um, the Sheikah tribe, which you know is where uh Impa came from, and uh, various other characters throughout the history of Zelda. Um, the Sheikah tribe used high tech tools to turn Hyrule into this advanced civilization. And then they use these four animal-based machines called Divine Beasts, as well as autonomous machines known as Guardians to protect Hyrule. Mm-hmm. And then this dark creature known as Calamity Ganon appears one day. And thanks to Zelda, Link, and those machines, they were able to defeat him and seal him away. And at this point, you know, Zelda, this is a, a Zelda that we do not ever meet in any game. And it's a Link that we never meet in any game. And they see, they defeat Ganon and seal him away. And then 10,000 years pass <laughs> <laughs> and Calamity Ganon starts showing signs that he's returning, but all the machines had been buried and the Zelda of that era was very young. So she hadn't awoken her magical abilities yet. And she was doing all this research to try to figure out how to awaken her abilities. So what they did was they appointed four champions, Mifa of the Zora, Daruk of the Goron, Rivali of the Rito and Urbosa of the Gerudo. And they're, they're appointed to pilot the Divine Beasts. And they fight alongside Zelda and this chosen knight named Link, who uh, he had the ability to wield the Master Sword. So Ganon learns about this, uh, and you know he apparently applies a lesson that he learned 10,000 years prior, because this time he decides like, oh, I'm not going to fight that giant force of people. I'm going to possess all of their machines and turn them against Hyrule. So he possesses the guardians and the four divine beasts. And in the process, this kills the, uh, the champions. So uh, Daruk, Mifa, Rivali, and Urbosa. And then like Link and Zelda are kind of like going from one base to another. And in the process, the, uh, the, the minions of Ganon attack Zelda and Link is gravely wounded trying to defend Zelda. And so Zelda took Link to the Korok Forest um, and left the Master Sword in the care of the Great Deku Tree, who was in the Korok Forest, and then took Link to the Shrine of Resurrection to heal his wounds. And then she went to Hyrule Castle to attempt to seal Ganon within the castle. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's the setup of Breath of the Wild. Link wakes up 100 years later and learns from the spirit of King Roam, who was the king of Hyrule that was defeated by Ganon that uh, Ganon is sealed, but he's getting stronger and that he needs to go and uh, go to the four races of the champions and purge them of Ganon's influence and recruit new champions to help him. And so along the way, he visits all these shrines, which were created by the Sheikah, and he recovers his strength and travels to Korok Forest and recovers the Master Sword. And that, what a great moment when you're finally able to pull that Master Sword. Oh, right? I'm like good. that. Yeah. And like, they don't tell you like how many hearts you need to, <laughs> to get it. And it's like, kind of like, oh, is this the time? And it's like, no, it's not. And then eventually it works. And it's like such a cool moment. I love that. Yeah. And I, yeah, it was, I played it at a time pre-release where I couldn't Google it, which is a blessing. I love that. I love that. I didn't know what I needed. It's so great. Absolutely. And uh, so Link then goes to Hyrule Castle, defeats Calamity Ganon within the castle and by the way, I think the official canon is that Princess Zelda was swallowed by Calamity Ganon when she went to Hyrule Castle. And she yeah. was calling out to Link. Like, you remember the early, the very beginning of 
uh, Breath of the Wild, Link wakes up to her voice, Link, Link, Link. Yeah. And she was calling out from basically the stomach of Calamity Ganon. And by the way, he's in this cocoon trying to like become more powerful so he can escape the seal that Zelda had put on him. And uh, basically Link uh, wakes him up before he's fully formed, which is why you see him in this such grotesque form. And, uh, you know, Link defeats him within the castle and then they go outside of the castle. By the way, one of the coolest moments, I think, is just like Link, you know, the castle basically explodes and Link is sent like flying out of the castle. Ganon, Dark Beast Ganon appears in Hyrule Field and Link just kind of paraglides safely down. And that's just such a cool scene of like Link smoothly gliding down as like Dark Beast Ganon is like revealed. Yeah, it is very cool. It's a good um, game, turns out. Yeah, it turns out this whole series is actually pretty good. And uh, he fights Dark Beast Ganon and uh, this is in Hyrule Field and Zelda gives him the Bow of Light and Link is able to use that power to target specific parts of Dark Beast Ganon. And then Zelda is able to use her magic to finally seal Calamity Ganon away. And then at the end, Zelda and Link begin a quest to rebuild Hyrule after the damage Calamity Ganon did to it. So yeah, there we go. There we have it. That is the the abridged but full version of... No, that's great. Because like I, I love the timeline. I not a scholar about it, but I read about it a lot and I enjoy it. But this is like a really, this answered a lot of questions I had. I, I appreciate you sort of walking me through it. So there, there's a lot of stuff to take in there. And apologies if like you're a big timeline nerd for Zelda and you're like, you skipped this part. You skipped, I tried to keep it somewhat concise given the scope of everything that was in here. Um, yeah. Like Kyle mentioned, I did not really pay much attention to, uh, triforce heroes and you know but i don't know if you you didn't really skip much else though i mean honestly I yeah think. tried to tried to give like a, a a wide view and then you know tears of the kingdom right around the corner here exactly one week from when you're hearing this episode if you're listening to it on release day we will see the direct continuation we're led to believe of breath of the wild and uh now hopefully this helped you kind of get up to speed on like what has happened why everything is the way it is and uh you know i'm excited to see where they go from here with with this story and kind of how all of this history plays into what is uh, you know again not officially confirmed by nintendo but highly speculated as the uh the last entry on the timeline chronologically and like you know if it if tears the kingdom is going to pay as much lip service and homage to kind of the historical events of Hyrule to this point as breath of the wild seem to. Yeah. So we will, uh, we'll be talking all about tears, of the kingdom next week. As you might imagine, you'll get a, a and maybe full, for the rest of the year, maybe the rest of the year. Yeah. You'll get a full <laughs> review on next week's episode. Uh, so look forward to that. But Kyle, I think that is an episode. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about the Zelda timeline. Any parting thoughts before we uh, wrap up here? Uh, let's bring Twilight Princess to Switch, please. I'll take Wind Waker as well. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, eternal plea. It's like a, it's a cycle much in the way of Ganon's resurrection and his search for the Triforce. Uh, every episode in this this podcast needs to end with a plea for Wind Waker and Twilight Princess to come to Switch. Maybe they'll surpri surprise release it on May 11th, just a day before, <laughs> you know? In case you're hurting for some Zelda uh, <laughs> games, here's one. One day before the <laughs> game we be definitely so don't stupid. want to cannibalize sales of. Oh, that'd be so funny and dumb. That would just be like the worst. <laughs> At least give us a week, man. <laughs> But anyway, Kyle, thank you so much. Uh, we will talk all about Tears of the Kingdom and everything around that game next week. But uh, thank you so much to everyone for listening. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, throw all things Nintendo a five-star review and hit that subscribe button. And if you want to get any questions or comments, then you can get in touch with me at allthingsnintendo at GameInformer.com or hit me up on Instagram at Brian P. Shea. And then you can always join the Game Informer Community Discord, which is a perk for subscribing to our Twitch channel even just for one month. Kyle, go ahead and tell people anything you want about your online presence. Uh, follow me, I guess, on Twitter. I need to, what's it, Blue Sky? That's the new one. I need to get, someone send me an invite to that. I'm That's waiting for blog. mine, too. Yeah. Someone, someone sent Brian and me invites to that social. <laughs> I'm on the wait list. I could, I tried to get on the wait list. They gave me an error. Uh, what? So anyway. I'll That'll wait. be my grand return to a uh, Twitter-style 
of like a text-based social media. That'll be where right. Blue Sky lets me in. At least I'll give it a shot and see if it sticks. But for right yeah, now, uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow me on Twitter, and then also yeah, I always like to plug the Game Informer TikTok account, which is which is growing. Man, we passed a thousand recently, which is which is exciting. That was my my sort of first goal for that account. So. Hey, that's a good. I mean, when I kind of started resurrecting our uh, Instagram account, that was my first goal. It was like oh, we got to get yeah. up to a thousand, and. It kept growing and kept growing, and now look where it's at. It had a several-year head start over the TikTok. So, yes, go follow yeah, right, right. Game Informer on TikTok. But, Kyle, that is our show for this week. Thank you all again to everyone for listening. Take care. We'll see you next time. <laughs>